Hi, here we are. It's time for our weekly Bible study again. And uh, this week, we have a different lesson, um, especially for those of you that are in my seniors class. Uh, it's kind of a lesson that um, we needed probably, you know, 50 years ago, 40 years ago, but it's a great lesson. Um, we are starting the book of uh, Song of Songs, it's called now. And I hadn't paid a bit of attention to the fact that the name of this book of the Bible had been changed somewhere along the way. I thought, Song of Songs? When I learned the books of the Bible, it was Song of Solomon. And then somewhere along the way, it became Solomon's Song. And then now it's Song of Songs. So I thought, I'm not losing my mind. So I went back and I found my little Bible, my little white zipper well-worn out Bible from 1964, 14 years old, and it said Solomon's Song. I thought I knew that. And then I went back to an old family Bible that I have from 1834, even has the books of the Maccabees in it, and it is Song of Solomon. So I'm not crazy. This used to be called something else. And somewhere along the way, someone, somehow, they decided to change it to Song of Songs. Which means it's just the song above all songs. Just like we say King of Kings and Lord of Lords. It just means it's just the song above all songs. It's actually a poem. And it is a poem written about love and intimacy and um, probably um, it is a poem written by Solomon. Uh, some Bible scholars think, oh, maybe not. But for the most part, they agree that it's written by Solomon, uh, probably in his pursuit of the uh, Shulamite woman that uh, he was uh, courting to bring into his harem. Solomon had like 700 wives and 300 concubines. Uh, one of Solomon's downfalls, actually. But um, anyway, it talks about her dark skin, how her brothers made her work in the vineyard, uh, this type of thing. Our lesson tonight revolves around chapters 1, 2, and 3. And chapter it doesn't have any verses from chapter 1. Chapter 1 really uh, talks about, it's just their talking back and forth in this poem, about their mutual love for each other, their admiration and their love and how beautiful he thinks she is and and uh, just the general stuff like that. Very beautiful, very poetic, very beautiful, but it's just that mutual admiration and expressing their love for each other. There's a lot of allegories uh, that have been tied to this. Uh, some scholars say that it wasn't really a love story, that it was really written to uh, characterize God's love for Israel or Christ's love for the church, which it can certainly be applied to that. The purity and the total devotion and those things certainly apply, but it just appears to be written as this beautiful love story, this beautiful love song, poem. Um Solomon's wives, of course, he had this huge harem, uh, but his wives were primarily princesses of uh, foreign countries, uh, maybe brought in, you know, as a token to keep peace with those countries, the surrounding countries and everything. The only name of any of Solomon's wives that is mentioned is Nama, or Nama, I think is probably the way it's pronounced. Um, and she was the daughter of Pharaoh, the Egyptian Pharaoh, and her son was Rehoboam, who became Solomon's successor. And so she's actually named, but um, she's the only one of his wives that's actually named. And then we know that we have this this dark, complected, uh, beautiful woman that Solomon thinks is just absolutely beautiful. And he's very much in love with her and their their passion for each other. Literally, their passion for each other is very much described in this beautiful love song. The shame of this is, is that ancient societies, as well, of course, as our own, have just absolutely distorted the, the beautiful intention of intimacy that God established between a husband and a wife. Uh, this this poem um, describes 
the uh, the purity and the the beautiful intimacy that they want, and it puts it in a a language that uses um, nature a lot, uses nature a lot to describe uh, describe that intimacy and that desire and that passion. And so as a result, it's done very clearly, but it's not done in a vulgar way. And it's done in a way that that it um, that it's good and that this intimacy is a blessing that's given to us by God and that it's pure and it's good and and it becomes a blessing for the two who uh, who partake of this intimacy, who who are part of this intimacy if it's done with God's wisdom and in God's way and that it's a precious part of God's creation without reservation in, in an, exclu an exclusive bond of romantic love, that it can be this beautiful, beautiful thing that's part of God's creation. And so um, they chose some verses that are odd, but they teach some lessons. And so we take a verse like from chapter one, a few verses from chapter two, and a few verses from chapter three to do today's study. So um, the first verse is uh, verse 15. We take no verses from chapter one, excuse me. That was just that interaction between the two and talking about how beautiful she was, how much passion they have for each other. So in verse two, we start with, chat with verse chapter two with verse 15, and it says, uh, Take us the foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vines, for our vines have tender grapes. And what we believe that this refers to is the need to protect the relationship. They're using nature as, as the example, as the allegory, using nature um, that the vines had to be protected. These little foxes would come in and they would scamper through the vineyards and, and actually they didn't even look like, you know, you, you just see these little foxes, they're beautiful. And you think, oh, how cute, they're scampering around, they're doing all this stuff. but. They have to be, you have to be so careful because you have to protect the relationship. Protect the relationship. The relationship is vulnerable, just like it said the vines that have tender grapes. These these vines would bloom and then these, these grapes would come on and they would have to be tended and protected in order to really enjoy this healthy harvest. And so there, it's talking about the vulnerability of those vines and the vulnerability of our relationship between a husband and wife. And so if these little foxes were allowed to come in and to gnaw away at the vines, those distractions, that distraction, that disturbance of the vine would hinder the harvest. And so if we have distractions in our relationships, if we if work becomes more and more demanding and we spend more time at work and, and less time communicating, loving, sharing time with our family, with our wife, then it becomes easier and easier to do until eventually we almost feel like strangers at times and, and the distance between us grows. And so just like those vulnerable vines in the vineyard, the relationship is vulnerable. And things can gnaw away at it. And when we allow those things to take priority over the relationship, that relationship suffers. And you don't want the relationship to suffer. You want it to have that bountiful harvest, just like the vines would do if they were tended and protected from the foxes. And so we've got to realize that these distractions and that these things that, that overtake us can damage the relationship. And so we have to strengthen that bond. We have to be very aware of what those distractions might be, of what those um, damaging features could be that come into our relationship. And be careful not to turn to selfish interests. You know, eventually some people in relationships that grow weaker and weaker and weaker turn outside that relationship to find companionship and, and solace and joy. And, and then you have a completely broken relationship. And we certainly don't want that. And so I think that's what this verse is saying is understand how vulnerable the vines are and how important it is to tend those vines, to protect those vines from the predators 
that might come in. So our relationship, protect the relationship, protect it from the predators that might come in. Guard that relationship. Spend the time that that relationship requires to build that relationship. And then we go to chapter 2. That was the only verse from chapter 1. We go to chapter 2, verses 16 uh, and 17. And verse 16 says, My beloved is mine, and I am his. He feedeth among the lilies. This is talking about the exclusive part of this relationship. My beloved is mine and I am his. We belong to no one else. We are each other's. We have committed to each other. Now, this couple is not married. This couple is in the courting stage at this point in their lives. And we're going to talk about those stages a little bit. But they're in the courting stage, and yet they are totally devoted to each other. I am his and he is mine. Building that relationship, talking about the exclusive, exclusivity of that relationship, that we don't dabble in other relationships when we come completely devoted to someone. You know, animals, nature, things like that may be totally different, but God laid the ground rules for us, and we're to have exclusive relationships, exclusive marriages, and then the intimacy within that relationship can be enjoyed shared only between those two. She's dedicated to her future husband. Her future husband is dedicated to her. And they're stating that in this sentence. He belongs to me and I belong to him. That mutual devotion and the submission. And uh, see, he feedeth among the lilies. That's, that's the way of using nature to talk about the intimacy. Feeding on the intimacy. Feeding on on that intimate relationship. You know, as I, as we read through this and you think back, we, we just got through studying, you know, um, we've studied Ephesians. Uh, we've studied Colossians before. And, and if you look back in Paul's writing, as we studied Proverbs and, and even now in this, it's amazing the things that Paul evidently drew from because he knew these scriptures to write those books because he talked in depth about the Christian husband-wife relationship both in both of those letters to the letters to the people at uh, in uh, Colossae and also to the Ephesians. And so he talked about the devotion, about the submission and, and the how the man was to love like Christ loves the church, to love his bride. And he talked about many of the things that are actually addressed in this song of Solomon to his beloved. Um, and then, like I said, that he feedeth among the lilies, that mutual submission to each other, that we are there to, to feed each other, to feed each other in that intimate relationship, to, to supply the needs and to... Um, to be there for each other. And then in verse 17, it says, until the day break and the shadows flee, until the day break and the shadows flee away, turn my beloved and be thou like a roe or a young heart upon the mountains of Bethar. A row, I had to look these up. I'd never heard these, these terms before. A roe is like a, a little female gazelle. Uh, a young heart is like a young deer or a young stag. And I had never heard those terms come from a hunting family and everything else. And I'd never heard those terms. And so again, using nature to describe that passion and that, that desire for each other. If you've ever watched during the rut and things like that, these animals and, and the dance they do, the, the, the things they do to attract each other and the and it's it's beautiful to watch nature in that way but god laid the ground the ground rules for us and he's and she's saying or he is saying i'm not sure um uh i think this is her saying this in this poem until the day break and the shadows flee away turn my beloved and be thou like the rower the young heart upon the mountains of bether this is, this is the endurance until the daybreak and the shadows fall. 
from morning till night, night until morning, this relationship is going to endure. It's, it's the endurance and the, the devotion of this relationship that they're talking about. This relationship isn't here today and gone tomorrow. This relationship is a bond that won't be broken. The total devotion of that relationship and then the passion involved in that devotion. The next verse uh, comes from chapter 3, and these, this is kind of a long passage. This is verses 1 through 4. And as I read this, this was evidently um, written in this song as a dream that she had. And so listen to this. By night on my bed, I sought him whom my soul loveth. I sought him, but I found him not. I will rise now and go about the city in the streets, and in the broadways I will seek him whom my soul loveth. I sought him, but I found him not. The watchmen that go about the city found me. To, him I, to them I said, Saw him thou my, whom my soul loveth? It was but a little after I passed them, but I found him whom my soul loveth. I held him and would not let him go until I had brought him into my mother's house and into the chamber of her house that conceived me. This was evidently written into, most of the scholars believe that this was written as a dream, that she, she wakes up and she realizes, of course, that, that the one that she loves is not there. And it, it's almost a panic because she's, she's wondering, will I have him again? Will I ever have him again? Is he gone for good? I can't imagine life without him. I think that's, that's the thought, that's the feeling in her heart, the feeling in the gut of her stomach that she can't imagine life without him. And so even though it may be the middle of the night in a city, she's going to go out and she's going to search for him. She's willing to put herself at risk to make sure she saves this relationship. She's willing to put everything she knows at risk to save this relationship. And so she goes out and, and she searches for him and she can't find him and it's scary to her. It's scary to her that she can't find him. Um, and so she searches, she she passes the police of that day and, and that's the first thing that she asks them is, have you seen the one that my soul loves? Every time she describes him, she describes him as the one that my soul loveth. There's no other description for him. She is totally devoted to him. She loves him in the depth of her soul. The one that my soul loves. Not just the one that I have a passion for. Not just the one that, you know, I got the hots for right now. Not any of that. This is the one that my soul loves. This is to be my soul mate. My partner for this lifetime. And I cannot imagine life without him. Have you seen him? Have you seen him? And then she goes on and she continues to hunt. And after she passes uh, the guards, she does find him. And then look at what she does. She finds him and she says, uh, And then I found him whom my soul loveth. I held him and would not let him go. I'm not letting you go again, buddy. I've got my claws in you, and you are not getting away this time. And look what she does. She makes a decision. Where had she come from? She had come from her own house, from her own bedroom. She awoke, and she went out into the streets. But look at the decision that she makes. After she found him and decides she's never going to let him go again, she takes him to her mother's house. She takes him to a safe place. She does not take him back to her bedroom. She takes him to her mother's house, to a safe place, into the chamber of her, to the house of her that conceived her. No one loved her any more than her mother, so there was no safer place to keep the one that her soul loveth than in the chamber of her mother, in the home of her mother. You know, when I thought of that and thought through that, I thought, what a decision she made because she did not take him back to her house. The, the love and the passion that they have for each other, they might have broken the purity of their relationship had she done that. So she took him to a safe place. And then I also thought about the fact that 
when we have a relationship and we join that relationship with marriage, we actually join families. We join extended families. I have a son-in-law and a daughter-in-law that are mine. I love them. They are like my children. I love them. I look around. I mean, my mother loved my husband. My daddy loved my husband. He wasn't perfect, and they loved him anyway. You know, and for those of us who didn't have exactly perfect in-laws or relationships with our in-laws, we longed for that. We longed for that. I, I've looked at relationships in our church, and I've seen some just beautiful relationships. Rod Dixon with his mother-in-law was precious. We had some beautiful relationships with these extended families. Because when you, your parents will tell you, when you marry a girl, you marry her family. Or when you marry a guy, you marry their family too. And that's true. And I think that is a little bit of a glimpse of what we see here. She wanted to take the one that her soul loveth, the one that she never wanted to lose in her whole life, to a safe place. And she took him to her mother's house, a place that she trusted, a place that she knew was a safe place for them. And then this next verse, which is the last verse of this lesson today, is this young woman, woman giving a charge to the other young women of Jerusalem, telling them how important it is, how important it is to guard the purity of your marriage, of your relationship. And so listen to this. In verse 5 of chapter 3, it says, um, I charge ye, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the rose and by the hinds of the field, that ye stir not up nor awake my love till he pleases. Again, using that young gazelle, and then hinds is also another term for the young male deer. Um, so, like the animals, there's passion. You know, the animals don't wait for marriage. They, they breed you know, and, and, and proliferate, you know, they, that's their thing. But God laid down our, our rules and our rules are that we have intimacy in marriage, not before marriage. And so she's saying, you know, don't stir up love. Don't awaken love. Don't awaken the intimate part of your relationship until he pleases, until the time is right, until God's timing is right. Protect the relationship. And part of the protection of the relationship is the purity of that relationship. The purity of it before marriage and the purity of it after marriage. You know, not the world's description. Not the world's distortion. This is a totally different book from any other book in the Bible. You know, we read through the Old Testament and it's all about the history and the law. It's all about the wisdom and the, the prophecies. And then you get to this book, and it's just this beautiful love story, love poem about marriage and love and intimacy. And, you know, the name of it changed, and I hadn't even noticed. That's how often I read this book. When I'm reading the Bible through, I skim through this book. I'm sure pastors use this book a lot to do premarital counseling and even marriage counseling because there's some really good wisdom in this book about the relationship before and the relationship during marriage. But for the most of us, we don't really spend a lot of in-depth time in this book because it's not teaching us the law. It's not teaching us the history. And then in New Testament, we, we learn about grace and salvation and eternal life and all of those things. But this book is just different. It's totally different from any other book in the Bible. But it teaches us. It teaches us. It presents the beauty of the relationship between a man and a woman before the marriage and after the marriage. The beauty of that relationship where intimacy belongs how do we treasure intimacy, how we treat intimacy, that it's 
it's without abandon within the right relationship. Not the way the world distorts it, but the way God has us have it and the way God has us protect that relationship. Thanks. God bless.